Were you the butterflies? Are y'all confused? What you're feeling right now is exactly how I felt as I sat at the bedside of one of my hospice patients, Ms. Cheryl, very early on in my career. It was a seemingly normal visit, as normal as it can be for a patient with terminal untreated cancer. So I wasn't really doing much other than sitting there at her bedside charting. And as I was sitting there, I heard her ask that question out of the blue. Were you the butterflies? My eyes immediately jumped from my tablet to my patient, then to the doorway, trying to see if someone else had walked into the room, but it was just us. I leaned forward and touched her arm and said, I'm sorry. And she turned ever so slightly in my direction and said, I was asking my son if he was the butterflies. As I stepped out into the hallway to talk to her husband, his eyes filled with tears as he told me about their son dying in high school and how afterward my patient saw butterflies everywhere. Now, I wish I could say that I walked back into my patient's room and sat at her bedside and witnessed that beautiful conversation unfold between her and her deceased son, but that's not what happened. Instead, I walked to my car and called our physician and asked him what medications to give to a patient who is hallucinating. And I will always regret that decision. Now, if you knew me growing up when I was a child, this would really surprise you how hesitant I was about the idea of an afterlife when I started in hospice. To me, I was raised in a very strict religious household and the idea of an afterlife was as plain of a fact as the sky being blue. And then when I was 15, the world as I knew it ended. I was at a high school football game and in front of myself and hundreds of other people, my friend Taylor went up to catch a football and two players from the opposing team hit him and his liver ruptured, killing him almost instantly. And I became extremely confused and skeptical of everything. I would sit in church and just say, what kind of loving God would take my friend and allow certain other people to, to stay here? And it really rocked my foundation. And I just really began, began to question everything that I was hearing. And as I moved on in my hospice journey, this patient was not the only one who was seeing deceased loved ones. I had Miss Sue, whose husband came and got her at the end and her death anxiety was wiped away. And Miss Edith, who had severe dementia and was able to seemingly communicate with me at the end of life and even predict what would happen later on. And as I had all of these experiences, I just had one question. What the heck is going on? Because this just did not jive with my atheism. I felt like I could, it didn't, I felt like I could piece everything together and put it into pretty little boxes and make it make sense. And as so many of you in this room know, medicine wholeheartedly supports this thinking. They take something as complex as depression and we put it into pretty little boxes. I know I'm not the only one in here who can check the correct boxes on a PHQ-9 in five seconds flat. It is, and every symptom has a medicine, every disease has a treatment protocol. And to me, I thought I can take all of these experiences and I can make them make sense and I can disprove all of this as a hallucination. And then I met Miss Margaret. Miss Margaret was still in the hospital whenever I met her. This was not my first experience of people seeing deceased loved ones or having surges of energy. But when I went and saw her in the hospital, I talked to her nurse outside of the room and she told me that the night before her heart had stopped and through the efforts of this nurse in front of me and many others, they were able to bring her back through CPR. As soon as she was conscious again, she asked to go home on hospice. So I came and I admitted her and the doctor warned me that her heart was gonna give out at any minute and she probably would not even make the drive home but that is not what happened at all. I actually got to spend many months with Miss Margaret and I was always amazed at how happy she was despite her circumstances. And she was not the first person to tell me, oh, live life to the fullest. So many patients had told me that, 
But before then, I always thought of that as, I need to go take a big trip. I need to go skydiving. But to her, she had a different theory. To her, living life to the fullest was finding everyday joy. It was using fine china on a Tuesday. It was laughing with a coworker. It was taking a scenic drive. And I always wanted to know what she saw when she died. And I was always searching for that time to naturally ask her, but it never came. Instead, when she seemed happy with my understanding of what a life well lived looks like, she offered it to me. It's beautiful, you know, she said to me out of the blue one day. And I said, what is? And she said, the afterlife. I can't wait. Sorry, I miss her so much. She's wonderful. Through Miss Margaret, Miss Cheryl, Miss Sue, all of these people, I really started to rethink how I had been not only thinking, but I began to scrutinize my actions because I was not simply present with them. I was constantly analyzing and looking for a reason for all of this happening. And as I started to really look back on my life, I realized that everything in my life had been trying to find an answer. My Episcopalian beliefs were an answer, and so too was my atheism. And I started to understand that a joyful life does not come from us having it all figured out. It's our ability to simply enjoy these unexpected moments. And as I began to accept this and was able to really sit there with my patients as they saw their deceased loved ones, I started to really look forward to the next time that that moment would happen. So I'd wake up every morning and just be excited for that. And sometimes that would take hours and sometimes it would take months. But whenever it came, I was able to simply just be there with them. And as this started happening, this gradually just extended to all areas of my life. I would look forward to a surprisingly good cup of coffee or that song coming on the radio that you completely forgot existed. And as you roll down the windows and listen to it, you're back in that memory again for the first time. And I cannot wait for that moment to happen again. Um, I am no stranger to people saying that I smile too much for someone who works in hospice. <laughs> and I always smile back at them and say, it's a gift my patients gave me. And they truly did. I wake up so excited every single morning and I want you all to as well. So starting tomorrow, I invite you to ask yourself the question, when is my next beautiful moment going to happen? You might need to remind yourself, put a sticky note by your alarm clock or a reminder on your phone, but don't be surprised as just as regularly you find yourself saying, I knew my next beautiful moment would happen and here it is. Some many years after Miss Margaret, I took care of Mr. Al, Big Al, as many people called him. He was a chef in New Orleans his entire life, and he was pretty indifferent towards me in the beginning, and I was desperately trying to find a way to connect with him. I was falling short a lot, <laughs> and then one day I walked in, and he was eating red beans and rice, and I said, I tried to cook red beans and rice recently for my family, and it was not very good. And he said, well, walk me through the steps and I'll give you some tips. I did not get very far into my steps at all before he said, how long did you soak the red beans? And I looked at him confused and he looked very concerned. And I said, are you supposed to soak the red beans? And he said, you served your family dry red beans? And I said, that makes so much more sense. And he goes, honey, honey, come here. And she walks in and she's confused. And he said, you know how people are always saying that they pray for me? And she said, yeah. And he said, we need to start telling them to pray for whoever has to eat our nurse's food. <laughs> <laughs> that really bonded us. And every visit after that, we just grew closer and closer. One day I get a call from his wife that he was out of bed which is something that had not happened for probably a year. That surprised me alone, 
But what surprised me even more was when I walked in and he had a large kitchen knife in his hand. And I looked at his wife and she was very concerned. And instead of walking over and taking the knife from him and safely leading him back into bed, as I would have done at the beginning of my career, I walked up to him and placed my hand on his free hand and said, am I finally going to get to learn from the master? And he said, more than you know, my mom is here and she is the real master. So as I cut up vegetables under his direction, I got to witness him talk to his mom as if a school age child would talk to their mom about a field trip they were going on and they were excited about it. And we placed the red beans and rice on the stove to simmer and I helped him back into bed and I could still smell the red beans and rice in the air whenever I pronounced his time of death just a few hours later. When I went to his funeral, it was clear that he was very loved by so many people. I did not expect any of his wife's time, but to my surprise, she came up to me and in her hands was his top secret red beans and rice recipe. And as I held it in my hands, I realized that the next beautiful moment had happened. In our industry, I see so many people attempting to analyze and control from that place. But I want to invite all of you to instead meet your patient where they are at. And in that moment, behold your next beautiful moment as well. Thank you.